Hey, well, good morning, church. Good to see you. How are you doing? No, I can't preach with that. Sorry, let's try that again. Good morning, church. How are you doing? Good, good. If you've looked at the outline, you have probably estimated that we'll be out of here in about three minutes, right? <laughs> good. The dads are like, I'm, I'm down, right? First in line for lunch. I'm down. Well, it's good to see all of you here. We're going to continue in part three today of our series called Destinations, Destinations. And last week, I just want to pop quiz you. How many of you remember the verse from, from last week? You probably remember the hand motions because it was wind shape week and we added hand motions and I bet you remember them, don't you? Okay, let's try it again without seeing it on the screen. What, is, what does the verse say? Proverbs 27, 12. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer harm. You did. Good job. Well done. You got it. So we checked out this verse last week that talked about the prudent and the simple. And we've been talking in this whole series about this concept of direction. It's called the principle of the path. And here's what the principle of the path says. It says this. It says that it is direction that determines destination. Direction determines destination. Not intentions, not hopes and dreams, oftentimes not even our prayers, but our direction, our daily decisions that we make that determine where we end up in life. And you understand this when it comes to driving. You understand this when it comes to any type of travel or hiking. But many of us, we have this disconnect for some reason in our mind that we think, well, I can treat my body this way and arrive at this destination, or I can handle my money this way, but I'll magically arrive at a different destination. I can, can treat my relationships a certain way, but I'm going to magically arrive at a destination that that path did not lead to. And the reality is, is that's not true. It is your direction, your daily decisions that determines your destination, not your hopes, not your dreams. And oftentimes what happens, God gets blamed for things that we have done. And this is a principle that whether you believe it or not is a reality. You can deny that gravity exists, but it's going to be painful, right? You can deny for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, but that principle exists, and this principle exists as well, that it is our direction, not our intention, that determines our destination. This is true in your marriage. This is true in your finances. This is true in your relationship. This is true in your health, in your education, in all areas of life. And then week two, what did we talk about? We talked about how the verse we just quoted, the prudent see danger and they take refuge, but the simple keep going and they suffer for it. What does that mean? That means that the prudent, the wise have the eyes to see, oh, this isn't going to work out. I'm on the wrong path. I need to make a change. They have that, that feeling in their stomach and they have those alarm bells in their head and they do what? They do something. They change their direction. They change their daily decisions. But the simple do what? They have the feeling in their stomach. They have the alarm bells in their head, but they think they're going to be the exception to the rule. I know a thousand people went down this path and it ended really bad for them, but I'm going to be the one who breaks that principle. And what happens? No, the principle breaks us. It is our direction, not our intentions that determine our destination. That when we see danger ahead, God, would you give us wisdom to know what to do? And would you give us courage to do it? Now, the problem with this whole principle is, is most of the decisions that we make, we don't see the fruit or the result of those decisions for a long time. You know what I mean? Like if you're studying for an exam, you're going to see the fruit the next morning. You're going to be confident. You're going to knock it out. Or if you didn't study, you're going to be nervous, right? But oftentimes we make decisions that play out for years into our future. So how do we, I mean, this is a, there's a lot at stake. When you're traveling, if you make a wrong turn, you go down a wrong path, you can lose minutes, hours maybe. But in life, you can lose years if you go down the wrong path, if you make the wrong choice. So how do we make the right call? Well, maybe, may, what if, what if, what if we created a database of all of our decisions and we just piled it the last hundred years of all human decisions. We piled them in a database and we were able to sit down with that database and go, okay, well, I'm thinking about doing this, plug in that, that choice, and the database spits out a response. Okay, well, if you do this, there's a 2% chance it's going to work. But if you do this, there's a 98% chance this is going to work. And we would think, man, that'd be pretty awesome, right? I can go find out, well, so-and-so married this kind of person, so-and-so handled their finances this way, so-and-so did this, and there was this result. And we would walk away and go, wow, I know what to do. But there's a problem. If you were given that information, would you actually listen to it? 
Would you actually follow it? Would you actually take that advice? Let's just be honest here for a second, right? Because we're friends. Here's my question. How many of you know someone who is very, very, very smart, but you've watched them make very dumb, foolish, crazy decisions? Go ahead and raise your hand. Come on. Don't elbow the person next to you. You're not raising your hand for them, okay? All right. How many of you, you are that wise person who makes really dumb, anybody in the house? I do. I, man, look, here, look, can I confess something for a second? I have been a part of every dumb thing that I've ever done. <laughs> I've been present. I've had my hands on the wheel. I've been a part of every dumb thing that I've ever done. And it wasn't because of a lack of information, was it? It wasn't because I didn't know what to do, right? Like we have this thing in us that pulls us towards man. We, we know we shouldn't, but I, I'm just going to try it one more time. I know it went wrong for everybody else, but I'm going to be the exception to the rule. See, for the most part, we crash and burn on the decisions that we made, the past that we chose, and it wasn't because of a lack of information. I mean, how many of you have gotten financial advice from someone and then just logged it away, kept it in a file, put it in a folder, and you never did it? I've done that before, man, that's great. And you didn't disagree with them, you just didn't do anything with it. How many of you have sat in a doctor's office and they've told you, man, you really need to start doing this, you really need to stop doing that, and you nod in agreement, you agree, like, man, thank you so much, and then you leave and you do what? Nothing, right? A week later, you're back at your same old habits. What is that about us? That has oftentimes wisdom, has information, but we still don't have the ability to follow it. It's not a lack of information that is our problem. So today, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that wrestles with this exact tension. I mean, there's a lot at stake in your life. There's a lot hanging in the balance. And the thing that makes this passage so relevant, so interesting, is not only what it says, but who said it. Who said it? It's written by Solomon, King Solomon. You've heard of Solomon before. He was the third king of Israel. He's King David's son. And Solomon has this unique perspective on what we're going to talk about this morning for several reasons. The first reason is because he has authored three different books in the Old Testament. The book of Proverbs, which we looked at last week and the week before, we're going to look at again today. It's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant book. Even if you don't believe in God, just go, just go check out Proverbs and tell me. You tell me if that's wise or that's foolish, if that's true or if that is false. He also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which you should not read unless you're already old enough to become a cynic, right? Unless you're very cynical about life, don't read Ecclesiastes. Because if you're not, if you think life is grand and you read Ecclesiastes, you're going to be like, why is this in the Bible? Man, what is Solomon's issue, right? Like, this dude just needs to eat a Snickers bar or something. I mean, what is his problem? But then when you get older and you get cynical, you're like, yeah, Solomon, man, that's my boy. I get it. I'm experiencing the same thing. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless is life. And then he wrote the book called Song of Solomon, which you shouldn't read unless you're married. <laughs> or unless you think the Bible is boring, then you should go check out Song of Solomon. You see, many of us, I mean, you just look at what Solomon has done. But the point is this. This guy has unbelievable insight and wisdom into all realms of life, not just theological, but you go read what he said in the area of science and mathematics and business and marriage and relationships. I mean, his insight was amazing. And the reason was, was when he became king, he was very young, 17, 18, 19, maybe 20 years old. He was super young. Imagine you as a 17-year-old becoming president. <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, and some of you are like, nope, that would not have been good at all. I couldn't handle myself at 17, much less an entire nation. But after David dies, Solomon is put in charge, and he has the responsibility to build the temple. In fact, you can go and see today the ruins, the leftovers of the temple that Solomon built. It's a real place. He's a real person, and these are real events. And one night, early into his leadership, God speaks to Solomon in a dream. And he says, Solomon, because I loved your father, I love you. Because I made a promise to your father, I'm going to promise 
you as well. And he says to Solomon, Solomon, ask me for anything that you want, anything that you want, and I will give it to you. Just ask. You want long life? I'll give you long life. You want a lot of money? I'll give you more money than you can handle. This is interesting. He says, you want me to kill all your enemies? I'll kill all your enemies. Imagine if you woke up and you, and you woke your spouse up. Hey, baby, gra gra grab a pen, grab a piece of paper. God just told me we can take out all our enemies. Who do you want to put on the top of the list? <laughs> and so Solomon has this revelation from God. And he can look, that's what kings did back then, didn't they? I mean, anybody who threatened the throne, they would take out preemptively. And so God says, Solomon, just tell me what you want. Ask for anything and I'll give it to you. And Solomon says to God, this is fascinating. You know what Solomon asks for? He doesn't ask for money. He doesn't ask for years and long life. He doesn't ask for the destruction of his enemies. You know what he asked for? He asked for something that speaks into what we're going to talk about today. He says, God, I'm so overwhelmed with the burden of ruling this nation. I'm so young. I'm so inexperienced. I'm so overwhelmed. I've got this vast kingdom, and I'm going to make decisions that are life or death. For people. I've got all this responsibility on my shoulders. I'll tell you what I want, Lord. I want wisdom. I want discernment. I want understanding. I want to have good judgment. I need knowledge and wisdom and understanding because you've appointed me to rule this great people. You know what God says to him? God's response to Solomon's question. This is the passage for today, but I'm going to put it up on the screens. Our tech team is going to put it up on the screen. So just for a little context, so you know who wrote this. Here's how God responds to Solomon. Here's what he says. He says, since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and a discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you in history, nor the future will there ever be. And God promises to make Solomon the wisest man to ever live. And you may, you know, you may be new to church. You may be checking out God for the first time. You may have had a bad church experience, and you're just now revisiting and, and discovering that, that, that not all churches are crazy and not all churches uh, hurt people. And you're, you're trying to maybe seek after God again. And you may not even believe this whole Bible thing. But when you stop and you read the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Song of Solomon, you're going to have to reconcile, well, if this isn't true, then how is there so much gold? How is there so much wisdom? How is, there, how is Solomon, who was a real person, how did he know all of these things? And you have to say, wow, maybe there is something to this. And so Solomon began to write, and he began to teach, and he began to administrate. He was literally the wisest man in the kingdom. And as this verse says, the wisest man who ever lived or will ever live. Now, the reason this is so relevant for our discussion this morning is if there was ever a person in the world who could say, God, thank you for the wisdom. You can have a seat and go do whatever you do. I've got this on my own. It was Solomon. But when Solomon addresses the question, how do I know which path to take? I've got all these things going on in my life. I've got to make decisions that are going to have ramifications for the rest of my life. The decisions I make are going to have a huge impact on the people around me. How do you, Solomon, know which path to take? And when Solomon begins to wrestle with that question, he doesn't say, well, I'll tell you how I do it, man. One time I had this conversation a long time ago, ago with God, and he just, he just gave me all this wisdom, and I just operate on that wisdom. No, when Solomon answers this question, he says something that really, based on who he is and what his experience was and his level of wisdom was, should really take us by surprise. Solomon, how do you handle the big decisions in your life? How do you know which path to take? Here's how he replies. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. He says this. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. So let's just stop right there in that verse for a second. His answer to the question of what path do I go down? How do I know if this is the right person? How do I know how to handle my finances? How do, I, how do I know how to navigate all of these decisions in life? Solomon, the wisest person in the world, who could have just answered on his own wisdom, said this. He said, trust in the Lord. Trust in God with all your heart. To trust, 
To trust means to lean hard into, to lean hard into, not on information, not on insight, not even the wisdom that God has already given him, not the facts, not his experiences, but to lean hard into God himself. To lean hard into the person of God. The answer to our questions, to our decisions is not found in a database of information. It's not found in our personal experiences. It's not even found oftentimes in the wisdom of people around us. It's found when we trust in God, when we lean on Him. He has invited us, He has commanded us to lean hard into Him. And again, Solomon is the one who could have bypassed God. Oh, hey God, you know, I appreciate that. But I'm good. No, instead what he did is say, God, I'm going to lean hard into you, even though I've already had this conversation and I've got tons of information. God, I'm going to lean hard into you. Solomon is saying this isn't a one time thing. This isn't, man, yeah, I grew up in church as a kid or, yeah, I had some wisdom here. No, no, no. He's saying every single day to lean hard into, to trust God, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then on the flip side, The verse continues and it says this. He says, lean not on your own understanding. Not only do you need to lean hard into God, but don't lean too hard on your own understanding. That phrase means to prop something up against. You ever ever propped yourself up against something that you thought was dependable and it wasn't? (laughs) Right? A chair that you thought would hold, a wall that you thought would hold, the person that you thought was waiting for you. A seat that you thought would be there, maybe in middle school, a friend pulled it out in front of you. It's to, it's to not lean, to not prop yourself up against something that's not going to hold you. And what Solomon is saying is our tendency is to make decisions based on our way of seeing it, based on what we have experienced it. And here, here's how we say it. We get in conversations, and this is mostly us as men. We go, well, this is how I would handle that. This is what I did in the past, or this is what you should do. Like, we don't even often listen to the person we're supposedly having a conversation with. We're just waiting until they stop talking. So then we can talk. Have you ever done that? I find myself, oh, I've got a great response. I'm sorry, what were you saying? And you try to throw it out. Like, this is what I would do. And that's my knee-jerk reaction, is to lean on my experience, my wisdom, my knowledge, and my own understanding. And that's not to say we shouldn't be growing wiser and, and gaining wisdom as we get older. Of course, that's part of it. But what Solomon is saying is, look, even with all of that, even with all of your experiences that you have learned, the things you've heard from other people, the things you've learned the easy way, the things you've heard, you've learned the hard way. Don't make the mistake when it comes to choosing your path in life of thinking, I'm old enough. I'm smart enough, I'm wise enough, slick enough, cool enough, careful enough to lean on my own understanding. He's saying, even with all my wisdom and knowledge, every single day, I'm going to depend on the person of God. Whether it's my marriage, whether it's my business, my education, whatever it might be, lean not. Don't prop yourself up against something that can't hold you. Instead, lean hard into the person of God. Of God. And look, this is the wisest person who ever lived who said this. He's saying that direction doesn't begin with information. Knowing which path to choose doesn't begin with information. Direction begins with submission. Direction begins with submission. Submission always precedes, it always comes before direction. You begin trusting in the Lord with all your heart. What that means is, God, I'm not going to trust. I'm going to trust you with all my finances, even though I may have some skill, even though I may have had some wins in that area of my life. Lord, I'm going to trust you with my finances. Lord, I'm going to trust you with my family. Lord, I'm going to trust you with my marriage. I'm not going to wait until all my options are bad and then come running to you. I'm going to trust you with these things on the front. And I'm letting you know up front that I'm trusting you with all my heart and I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. And then Solomon continues and he kind of repeats himself to emphasize this. In verse 6, he says this, In all your ways, acknowledge him 
In all of your ways, acknowledge him. All of your ways, your marriage ways, your entertainment ways, your dating ways, your morality ways, your education ways, your professional ways, your health ways. In every area of life, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to acknowledge you. Let me just talk to my fellow churchgoers. We oftentimes think, God, I'm going to trust you on Sunday morning because that's the time when I feel holy. It's easy to be holy, like the songs are good. I'm going to trust you with all of my Sunday ways, all of my religious ways. No, no, no. It's about submitting to God every single area, every single day in our lives, not just the ones you think you need him. Acknowledge him in all your ways, everything that you do. God, you're the Lord over my money. God, you're the Lord over my marriage. God, you're the Lord over my business. God, you're the Lord over my entertainment. You're the Lord over my weekends. You are Lord. And I'm going to acknowledge you in every single area of my life. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And then Solomon says, this is the result. He says, and he will make your, what's that next word? Your path straight. He will make your paths straight. As a result of trusting God, leaning not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledging Him, you know what God promises to do? He will make your path straight. Now that does not mean you, your, your path goes from crooked to straight. It doesn't mean you're not going to have left turns and right turns. What that means is God's going to make your path clear. He's going to reveal to you what is plain and what you need to see. He's going to reveal to you which path you should take. But you see, submission precedes direction. And our problem is we often don't see which path was clear until we've already gone down a path, right? Have you ever had someone come to you and they're I mean, telling you how how bad the destination they did not intend to go on, but they directed that way, and that's where they ended up. And they're venting to you. I mean, this is so rough. This is so bad. And they ask you, well, what do you think I should do? And you, you kind of think, well, I don't know what you should do now, but I know what you should have done yesterday. I know what you should have done last year. I know what you should have done five years ago. Like, everybody was warning you. Everybody was telling you. But you didn't listen, right? Hindsight is twenty twenty, And whether you say that or not, I know you're thinking it. Or you may feel that about your own foolish decisions. You get to a destination you're like, you're like, how did I get here? Why, why did I do that? And it's easy to Monday morning armchair quarterback and say, well, you should have done this. And that's kind of the point, isn't it? Once you go through it, the path is clear. Now you've already gone down that path. And now you have the opportunity to change it, but you've already gone down that path. But that's the point. God wants to get involved on the front end. So the path is clear on the front end. He wants you to be able to see early before you start taking steps. He wants to reveal to you. He wants to straighten out your paths. That's why God, who knows the future, says to you and he says to me, would you please submit to me? Would you please trust me? Would you please follow me? Before all your options are bad, before you've gone too far down, before there is a point of no return, before you come and yell at me and blame me and go, help me, help me, help me. Let me guide you down the straight path. We don't need more information. <laughs> we don't need more information. Come on. We are the most informed society to ever walk the planet, yet our problems are growing. It's not for lack of information. It's for lack of submission. It's for lack of trusting. It's for lack of following our heavenly Father. He will make your paths straight. And then the next phrase is, is so good. Again, he kind of repeats it for emphasis. Verse 7, he says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Do not be wise in your own eyes. You know what's interesting about this? Is if you know the rest of Solomon's story, you know what happened to him. You know what he ended up doing. This is amazing. This person with all this wisdom, with all this knowledge, with all of this insight, actually had an area in his life where he said, okay, God, I got this. You can have a seat. And he began to make some decisions 
that he regretted. He had all the wisdom. He's the wisest person to ever live. But he said, God, see you later. Thank you for the, the information, but I've got it from here. And in that culture, something that was common was for kings to marry the daughters of the, their enemy kings to try to, to bring security and stability. But that was not God's ways. That was not God's commands. But Solomon said, you know what? Everybody else is doing it. I think I should do it too. In just this one area of life, he said, I've got it. I'm going to lean on my own understanding. I see them doing this, so I'm going to go down that path as well. And you know what ended up happening? He ended up ruining his legacy, ruining his kingdom. From the inside out, his kingdom began to rot and to fall apart. It wrecked the kingdom, it wrecked his legacy, and it divided his family and ultimately divided the kingdom. And the moral of the story is this, is that information alone is not enough. Wisdom alone is not enough. Insight and experience are not enough. We need God. We don't need more common sense. We need a savior. We don't need more information. We need a heavenly father. And this one area, Solomon Disobey. Solomon leans on his own understanding, and he and his countrymen paid for it. So here's my question, and we'll pick this back up next week. Has there ever been a time in your life where you acknowledge God in all of your ways? Now, if you're a Christian, let me specify this. When you think about how much control you have over eternity, which isn't much, it's easy to give that to God. Okay, God, I need you for eternity, right? Like how much control do you have over eternity? Not much at all. And so God's like, yeah, you better trust me, right? Like you've got no control. I'm talking about the areas where you do have control, where God has given you the ability to decide and to make decisions. Those are the areas that are all our ways. Those are the areas where God wants to see us submit to him where we say, God, I've got plenty of experience. God, I'm someone who people come to advice for this situation, but I'm not gonna lean on my own understanding. Even in the areas where I'm the expert, I'm going to lean on you. I'm gonna acknowledge you in every area of my life. Because you know that eventually your pride, your arrogance, your self-centeredness, your self-sufficiency will mislead you down a path you don't wanna go on. You are aware that you have the potential, I have the potential to make amazingly foolish decisions, even though I know better, but because I'm depending on my own experience, my own wisdom. Have you ever surrendered the things that you tend to control to the control of your heavenly father? Because this is where Christianity gets real. This is where Christianity begins to change your life and the lives of people around you. This is where you get to experience what it means to trust God. This is one of those moments where you take an act of faith and you go to bed that night and you go, okay, God, I, I, I'm in, I did it. If you don't come through, God, this is gonna go bad. God, you are my only option. You are plan A and I don't have a plan B or a plan C. And that is where God goes, watch what I'm gonna do. Watch how faithful, how good, how wise, that I am. And God says, I love that because you're going to experience me in ways that you never experienced. You're going to see that I'm a good, loving, faithful Heavenly Father. Have you acknowledged God in your marriage? Have you acknowledged Him in your finances? Have you acknowledged God in the way you choose to entertain yourself, in your career, in your business, in your future, in your education, whether you're a middle school student, a high school student, a college student, or a grad student? Have you acknowledged God in all your ways? Because if you will, he promises to show you which path to go down. Being smart isn't enough. Knowledge and insight aren't enough. We need God. We need God him. And here's my favorite part, and this verse isn't on your, your outline or the screens, that you can just write it down. It's John 14, 6. God doesn't just provide us wisdom and information to follow. He sent himself. The person of Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus is saying, he says, I am the, what's the next word? I'm the way. I am the way. I am the path. I am the direction. 
I am the truth. I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. This is how much God wants you to get this right. He didn't just send a book. He sent a person. And from that person, we now have the testament of Jesus and his work and his ministry and our mission. He sent a person who didn't come and wield the sword, didn't come and threaten. You know what he did? He came and he laid his life down. He came and surrendered. He came and gave his life away to pay a debt that some of you didn't even know you owed. But every single one of us, because of our defiance, our disobedience, our dishonoring of God, we owe a debt we can't pay. And there's a path to God but it's through perfection. I don't know about you, but I am not qualified. And Jesus comes and does what we can't do and then offers us life, offers us a relationship. If we will what? Not go to church a bunch, not start to be a good person. No, no, all those things are on the backside. Those are things we do out of joy, not obligation. He offers us life through repentance and belief. If we would turn Again, another path term. If we would turn from our ways and follow him, if we would believe, he says he'll make us new and he'll show us why he put us on this earth. Doesn't mean life's gonna be easy, but it's gonna be good, even when it's hard, even when it's overwhelming, because you can trust and know that your heavenly father has got you. He's got you. Trust in the Lord all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, in every way. Acknowledge him. And he personally, through the Holy Spirit living in your lives, will make your paths straight. Isn't God good? He's incredible. Let's pray to him. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for Solomon. Thank you for the example of his life, Lord. Thank you for the preservation of his words. Lord, we all, every day, even today, some some are making business decisions, family decisions, health decisions, personal decisions, financial decisions. Lord, would you give us a relationship with you, Lord? Would you help us not to lean on our own wisdom, but to lean on you, Lord? Help us to see danger coming as we prayed last week, Lord. Help us to have the wisdom to know what to do and the courage, Lord, to do it. If there's anyone here today, Lord, who's never put their faith in you, I pray they would do that right now, Lord. They would receive you. They would repent and they would believe. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for how good you are, Lord. Guide us. We're all yours. Pray these things in Jesus' name.